Welcome to the Science Studio. We're in the auditorium of the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California. And my guest is Rodolfo Linas, who's chairman and professor in the Department of Physiology and Neuroscience at the New York University School of Medicine. Of course, we all come from somewhere. We all have roots. You haven't always been that. Where did you start? Yes, well, I was born in Bogota, in Colombia. Um, I studied uh, high school, and I did medicine there, and then came to the States about 45 years ago. Now, were your parents connected with the science at all? Yeah. And... Mm, mm, my family have always been physicians, so I had the fortune of having my grandfather and my father and uncles be part of the faculty of medicine. So it was indeed a, a medical family, if you like. Yeah, so was, was there any particular, any particular influence? Was there some scientist, or was it your, literally your family that, that well, uh, moved you in this direction? Obviously, uh, family moved me uh, very much. But uh, in particular, I had a very good relation with my grandfather who was a professor of psychiatry-neurology. He's a neuropsychiatrist, and he was the, the professor. And uh, uh, I lived with him for a year, as per his request. How old were you then? I was four. Four? Four. And I remember every millisecond of it, by the way, really. It was so interesting. So there was this, he had this huge house, and he lived. Uh, by himself, and people helping him, uh, and service uh, people. And so I was uh, allowed to play in this huge house all day. And he had his um, uh, office where he received patients. We looked patients on the door floor. And uh, this is memorable. This is, I've said, I've said it many times because it was so interesting. So I remember sort of you would play around, and you would look down on this uh, waiting room. And there would be people sitting, uh, very exciting. These very long corridors, and have all sorts of, I like mechanical things, so I had mechanical toys of all kinds, and winding toys and so on. So one, one morning I look out, and there's this man sitting, and then he suddenly falls to the ground and begins to make very strange sounds and movements. And my grandfather comes, and they take him into the office. So, you know, he had his office there, so come up for lunch. I'm waiting. Hey, hey, Grandpa, what happened to this person? Why did he move like that? I mean, it's so, to make the sounds. And it's, wasn't she ashamed? He, he didn't, he, wasn't he bothered by doing these things? So he says, well, he couldn't help it. The question is, what do you mean he couldn't help it? He said, well, he didn't want to make those movements. The question is, so if he didn't want to make the movements, why did he make them? And the, the answer was, well, you know, uh, you are not the master of everything that happens. There's something called the brain that you have inside your head, and sometimes it does things that you don't want it to do. And this is why he's coming here to see me, because he's ill. So at four years old, you were getting some basic neuroscience. No, so and then the question is, what? Please explain. <laughs> you know, and then, no, it was, I can see it. I mean, it's, it's, it is so vivid, and it, is, it was so dramatic. Uh, in, yeah, in fact, in, in, in the edition of this book in Spanish, there's Garcia Marquez wrote a prologue for it. And, he tells the story as he heard it. So it, is in, it was, in fact, a very important issue. And then it became clear that everything we do is the product of our brains. That without our brain, we're, we're nothing. And then the question is, is music the brain? Yes. Is language the brain? Yes. Is hating the brain? Yes. Is uh, eating and hoping and knowledge? And so, so we're just the brain with the body around to move, or what? The answer is, yeah, more or less. OK, now in this book that you just mentioned, called Eye of the Vortex, um, you take the position that all these things that you just talked about, the, the 
the glorious things and the terrible things all coming from cognition, from the brain, from the mind. Right. And we'll get into what we mean by mind later. But you argue that all of that is really driven by movement, by the, by, by the need to move, by the motion system. Absolutely. Could you elaborate? Yeah, sure. Um, if, you, if you look at biology in general, and you find uh, that uh, suddenly in evolution, something very interesting happened, which is macroscopic animals appeared. And what I mean by that is a whole bunch of cells that had lived for almost three billion years as individuals suddenly come together to form an entity that is larger than any one of them, which is advantageous because you have more mass, you, have, you, you can you can interact with bigger things than you can as a single cell. A couple of things are very interesting. The fact is, of course, when you do that, you buy death, which you didn't necessarily have before. Meaning, as a single cell, you live or die as per your state. But when you come together with others, if some others die, you die as well. So it is the ultimate commitment. <laughs> it's very true. So serious death appear after multicellularity appears. OK, so, so it, as you know, it happened about 600 million years ago, which means that cells, this is important, cells took almost four times longer to be ready to make multicellular systems than the time required to make us. So one can almost say the cell element is more complicated or more difficult to evolve than us as, an, as a multicellular entity. Important when we talk about feelings, if we ever come to that, or qualia. OK, so then you have a set of cells. And the set of cells can solve the problem of existing in two very basic ways. One is to grow, but maintain itself placed on a point in the ground, let's say. You are a plant, or you are a sessile organ. That is something that solves this problem by the universe coming to you. You cannot go to the universe. Those particular entities require no nervous system and have no nervous system. Plants don't have a nervous system. The other solution is to move actively, is to be able to displace yourself. Now, in order to survive, the dynamics of moving, you have to have some idea of where you're moving to. Now, the advantages of moving are huge because you can run away from danger. This is non-trivial. If there's a fire and you're a tree, you die. If you're a mobile system, you run away from the problem. So there's an enormous advantage to motricity. The problem with motricity ability to move is that you have to have three very important properties. First, you have to have the ability to move in a coordinated manner to be able to displace yourself. Secondly, you're going to have to have some prediction of where you're moving into. So you need a sensory system that tells you just go there or don't go there, but you're moving to somebody's mouth, so move away move somewhere. And the third one, and the most profound, is called intentionality, the desire to move. If you have the ability to move, and you have the ability to predict, but you don't have the desire to move, you don't. OK, so we have this word motricity, which means ability, to, to, move. Move. ability to move. And you tell a story about some organisms that are sort of halfway between the sea squirts. Indeed, for yeah, sure, right, yeah, yeah. So the question, of course, came up. Well, OK, Rodolfo, you know, it's interesting, but do you have a proof? And the question was, yes, in fact, there is a beautiful proof. It's not my proof. It was, it was taught me, or I first heard it from Romer in a cerebellar meeting we had in 1968 when we were doing comparative physiology of the cerebellum. And I was invited man who does evolution says, well, the only thing I can tell you is about this periphery, this, this elenterate, that is sessile and 
when it reproduces, it reproduces by making a tadpole-like system that has an eye and has a uh, vestibular system and so on. It moves around. When it finds a good place to, to become sessile, it becomes sessile, eats its brain, and basically becomes a plant again. So it gets to a point where it's, it's, it's found an environment where it wants to, to be. It, it locks into that environment. It doesn't need to need it move anymore. So like a plant, it is planted. And because it needs resources but doesn't need a movement organ or a prediction organ like a brain, it just eats the brain right. as it essentially It transforms it into some gut nutrition. type nervous system. Yeah, it becomes a bit of a gut. So I've heard people make a joke, by the way, that that's what happens to professors when they get tenure. Well, they get tenure. <laughs> but, but to yeah. some professors when they get tenure. <laughs> right. Yes, the, indeed, that is the case. So as you, can, as you can understand, this is a beautiful biological demonstration of what we're talking about. If you're going to move actively, you need a brain. Now, the opposite is also the case. Any animal that moves, however primitive, has a nervous system. Mm -hmm. And as you know, it happened almost as an explosive, an explosive way. A lot of different types of animals appear with a lot of different types of nervous systems. And by the way, when you look at the neurons, they're almost exactly the same, regardless of what animal you are. So if you're an octopus, if you're a spider, if you're a fly, if you are a vertebrate, still they have the same neurons, that is the cells that constitute the nervous system, the same channels, the similar type of response. So a very interesting, very deep issue happens part of the tissue becomes the nervous system, something that, A, again, generates motricity by activating muscles, uh, has a motricity a pattern, so that you can go forward, back, whatever, and has a desire to move, you know, intentionality. And that is present in all of them. So yes, the brain seemed to have evolved, or I believe, and many people agree, as the instrument for motricity, the, or the instrument to move. Now, because it is so closely related to prediction and so closely related to intentionality, one would make an impossible step and say, and you know what? Thinking may be nothing else than internalized movement. Why? Because it is through movement that we solve many things. And what is it that the brain basically does, ultimately, in all of us? What it does is generate premotor acts inside. It generates premotor events. All that we can do as human beings is, with our brain, is the activation of motor neurons. That is the only output. I tell my students, you only activate muscles or you activate glands or putting it differently you either move or drool that's all you can do in life it's true okay so you have this apparatus that defines movement beautifully that predicts that has all sorts of hypotheses on which to act so thinking is a premotor act And therefore, we are fundamentally moving animals that move intelligently. The more intelligent our movements, the more intelligent we are as animals. OK, now, that's, that's, I mean, people would immediately say and probably have said to you, well, come on, there must be more to it than this. I mean, we've got consciousness. I mean, well, where, where does consciousness come from? How does it emerge from this, this description you have of something moving. Yeah, OK. But that's a slightly different story. We can go there if you like right now. But uh, we probably should, should define uh, to make sure that uh, the initial statement, which is we are there to move, or the system is there to organize movement, is a possibly valid hypothesis. Now, the next point you make is very important because it has to do with intentionality. If you, again, as I said before, if you have the ability to move but don't, you don't use it, you don't move. So why would you move? What is the reason why you start your movements? Well, to many schools of thought, uh, the 
the most well known, the most agreed to, is the fact that these neurons have intrinsic properties like the heart. They're continuously beating, and then if you happen to be, let's say, a, a, uh, a shark, you have to be able to move in order to breathe. So movement is part of existing. In other animals, you can breathe without actually having to displace yourself, like we do. We just move up our chest and bring air in and out, but we can be sitting as we are now without necessarily walking. So now, what is this intentionality about? In the intentionality seems to be something related to our ability to have a perception of things, that is, to feel. You, why do you want to move? Because I, in quotes, feel like moving. Well, but I, I would argue that, you're, that isn't, something, isn't there something more fundamental there, which is that your system, your entire system, uh, one of its things it's doing in terms of homeostasis or in terms of energy use is trying always to maintain itself in a, in a viable energetic state. Right. So the whole system at some point says things like, I'm hungry or... No, no, it doesn't say you're hungry. That's not true. <laughs> We say we are hungry. Ah, we say we And this hungry. is exactly the point I'm going to. The, in order to breathe, in order to be a plant, you don't have to say, here, I am a plant doing nothing. It doesn't come to that. It simply is. The, the, the hope to move a plant would be a disaster, a tragedy. You know, here, I am a plant. I can't move. So, no. Uh, only when... The possibility to move is there, should we ask, can, should I, should I not? So, mindness is related to something, well, this is going to be a little shocking, so if you ask me, so why not? Uh, where does all of this come from? Well, this uh, feelings and desires and so on. Well, uh, my feeling is that uh, this irritability is actually cellular. That is, that among the reasons why it took so long to make cells, is that the cells are far deeper than we ever believed they were. Put it, putting it to go very quickly to the point and then come back a couple of steps. If our cells don't feel, we won't in the same ways that if our cells are not capable of contracting, we won't be able to move. Computation can't do it. You need effectors. Mm -hmm. Effectors for motility and effectors for sensation, for feelings. Hypothesis that these are, in fact, cellular elements. So once you have the ability to move, the ability to predict, and intentionality, which comes from the fact that these cells are irritable. They have sensing abilities that modify their internal environment to the point that the sensation, whatever that may be, is actually an intrinsic property of the cells. Then you have a complete system that can, of course, think, that can fear, that can do all of the things that we characterize as the mind, or as thinking, or as hoping, or whatever. So you're talking about a community of cells that each, that, that interacting together, have the capacity to register at any given moment their um, uh, state. Yes. And their state is converted eventually into what we would then describe as a feeling like, I am hungry. For instance. Yes or um, I am attracted to, or... What if, or, or <clears throat> all of those things that represent the descriptions of possible movements, which is what thinking is, internalized movement, right? Okay, now you're talking about whole organisms here. You're talking about eventually consciousness, about you're talking about things that we'll get onto, like right. qualia, yes, the, the right. sense of what it is to be, feel right. like something. But you didn't start there. You started with, uh, with very basic information at the cellular level. I mean, your, your training itself. I mean, let's move forward from when you were four. Yes, right. Okay. <laughs> so you, you've, you've been, um, 
you've had this wondrous experience of living in a house where strange things happen. You have somebody, luckily, who can explain them or begin to explain them to you. So that, I assume, motivates you to go and find out more. Yes. And so that then takes you to university, right? It, it takes me to the medical school. Uh, I go to the medical school uh, knowing that uh, I would learn more about the nervous system. And how the nervous system is supported and so on and so forth. By now, I am fully aware that we're just a brain and that the body is there to decide or to do whatever the brain requires the body to do. It's the, the great carrier of the brain, so the kidneys are there for the brain and so on and so forth. It's a little bit of a brain-related or uh, skewed view, but it's true. I mean, uh, people without brains are you know, not necessarily very healthy. So. Uh, I can imagine brains in a vat, so I can imagine that I could uh, conceive of somebody dreaming or thinking or whatever without having a body. So this system is a little bit asymmetrical. Okay, mm -hmm. so I wanted to learn about the nervous system, you know, anatomy, physiology, pathology, and so on and so forth. Interesting. Uh, Where are you now? You're now in Colombia, right? Yeah. Still in Colombia. Right? I'm still in Colombia. I go to a very good school, a uh, high school, probably the likes of which I've never seen since that time. Really superb. I mean, incredible, uh, outstanding. In that the teachers were particularly outstanding? Or? They were very outstanding. Uh, it is tragic in some ways, because my teachers were people who fled Europe during the war. So my professor of philosophy was uh, Mr. Jose Pratt, one of the most important theoreticians, in, social theoreticians in Spain. He taught me philosophy when I was 14 years old. Uh, Ernest Beim, who used to work in Cavendish Laboratory, taught me physics and math. Uh, Mr. Jorly, who was one of the professors of chemistry in, in France during the war, taught me chemistry. So, yes, well, you know, mm. I cannot, I tell you, I cannot thank enough <laughs> providence or the ability, whatever, it is, to produce this beautiful set of people who should not be teaching students of my age how to think. Or oh, perhaps they should. Okay, that's <laughs> another story. I'm, let me tell you, uh, oh, it, I, I am really a bit nuts in that direction in the sense that I find it so sad that we go to school and our brains get ruined by our teaching systems. You know, People teach you things instead of teaching you concepts. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to learn the tributaries to rivers that you can look up in a book. You are wasting time and memory and concept with things that you would have to be an idiot not to be able to memorize. I mean, it's, but you can take a photograph of it. So how is it possible that we spend so much time in being non-educated, wasting prime time learning things that have no use at all to you? In fact, what I notice is when I see people and I ask them, do you remember geometry, do you remember geography, do you remember these things? And says, no. We don't remember any of that. And this is almost universal. You know, the people who taught you geometry didn't like geometry. So they didn't teach us geometry. I remember my geometry. I remember it. They were taught by people who loved the ideas and would demonstrate things. They didn't have, there wasn't a pensum that you had to pass. You have to do this, right? But we're getting off the subject a bit. Not really, but... but so, I had a very lovely education. I was far from being a brilliant student. I simply did what I wanted to do. Uh, I passed, okay, and so on and so forth. But there was already... I already had a spin to what things I wanted to do. So, but anyhow, they, they were kind. They were supportive. I went to a good medical school. Uh, in the second year of medical school, I uh, told my father that I wanted to understand communism better. Communism. Yeah. And I wanted to learn physiology. 
So he said, okay. So um, you want to go to Vienna to a um, um, youth a peace movement. Right. Here's your ticket. And you're going to go by and uh, uh, look at uh, the physiology department in Zurich that Professor Hess, Nobel Prize winner of 1946, uh, it's the head off. Yes, fine. Go with peace and come in one piece if you can. So, find, found very quickly that communism wasn't really what I thought it was. Uh, I went to his people and I said, What shall we talk about? Uh, the freedom of uh, thinking and all that. And he says, Don't give us that. How much money can you generate for us, please? Mm -hmm. I said, listen, um, I thought, so the answer was something like, we have enough theoreticians, thank you. Can you help us or what? Mm. So thank you very much, I'm going to go to the physiology department, and that was it. Physiology, they were kind, interested, and we, I learned some physiology at that point. I came back to Colombia, told my father that communism wasn't what I was expecting, and he was very happy to say, it takes it generally a little longer for people to realize, but I'm happy for you. <laughs> so, uh, you know the old story. You know, if, you, if you are not a communist when you're 16, you have no heart. If you're a communist when you're 20, you have no brains. That was a statement at that time. We know now it's a little bit more complicated, but it was it wasn't presented at that time. So continue. So yes, I had some early electrophysiology experience. And it was very lovely. It was, it was uh, stimulation of the brains and animals and changing their behavior and so on. And the, the idea was incredible, which is that you could change the behavior of an animal and make them have rage, or make them be docile, or make them fall asleep by electrical stimulation. So somehow, the behavior was modulatable by electrical currents. Yeah. Okay, now I'm, I'm thinking of, um, again, back, going back to four, and you see somebody having some form of what apparently was some form of a seizure, yeah, which is electrical activity. Um, you gave a lecture um, yesterday and, and today in which you showed somebody receiving electrical stimulation and a dystonia, an inability to move. When do I? So there's a, a sort of interesting full circle there. <laughs> right. In fact, I've, that's, very, that's, that's very, uh, very interesting that you notice. Yes, I've said that many times. You know, it is, I remember being completely moved by the fact that you have this animal that was flying uh, there, being friendly and whatever, and you stimulate it immediately. The pupils get big and, sh you know. And uh, the response took, two or three seconds, and then the animal would do two or three things. One of them, it would attack something. Or it would produce this incredible sound, you know, this, this very prolonged vocalization that was deeply moving because he was coming from uh, deep in this. It was uh, an expression of, of total desolation almost. It was a cry, you know, you've seen animals do that. The other possibility is, had, you repeat this the event many times, and one of these three things would happen. Either the animal would attack, it would vocalize, or it would have an epileptic seizure. And then it would be fine. So somehow, having activated a whole bunch of neurons, there is particular things that this system can do with this activated bunch of cells. And depending where you activate, and what part of the brain you stimulate, you would have this kind of response that I'm telling you. Or in other cases, if animals simply would go to sleep. So you turn on, this is a sleep center, and go to sleep. So beautifully, you can address mind properties with electrons. Now, what do you mean by mind? You, you, in this book, you specifically talk about the mindness state. Right. Okay. Now, 
I both like and dislike deeply the term mind. The term mind uh, somehow suggests that there is something separable from the brain uh, that lives, that has its own, its own structure, its own existence. Well, but Paul Bloom has this phrase, natural born dualists, based on the, the old Descartes notion. Right. Okay. So, so, so because it feels that way, it feels as though there's a driver in there, a separate entity. Right? Uh, yes, it feels like it, but I don't think it is actually there. I'll tell you a story in a little bit as to how I finally seriously got rid of it, in my case, directly. Uh, I got rid of it to begin with by simply thinking about it, because you know, the question was, uh, when you study a little, when you study neurology, you study psychiatry, you do neurosurgery, and so on, you find that uh, if you if you anesthetize, as you had a story, in principle, you open somebody's head, you put local anesthetic, you find that the mind is soluble in local anesthetic. You know, what's going on here? Uh, what is it that we do when we do local anesthetic? What happens if you anesthetize the cells? You're blocking certain channels that prevent certain electrical activity from happening. So from everything you know, you say somehow electrical activity is deeply indirectly related to movement, feelings, or the total sum of which we can call the mind. Mind state simply is a particular functional event happening in somebody's brain that has certain components. It has a prediction component, it has a, it has a uh, component uh, that has to do with possible movement, it has a problem to do with intention. So I could say, minded states are states that have three components, as defined in the way that I just mentioned. So basically then, we have uh, an, an entity that can uh, organize and move that has as its, uh, ma this is a different point of view than many people have, so let me say it very carefully. Many people think of um, humans and animals to be mostly driven by reward. I do this thing so that I can get something back. I think that is wrong. I think uh, you do things because you have a drive to do things. Sometimes even if it's bad for you or if it hurts you, you will still do it. The intention, the, the drive with which there is nothing, I don't think is just a product or is in fact requires anything to do with being somehow given a price for doing it. You would say, why do you scale the mountain? Because I feel good. Nonsense. You just do it you have no choice. That is the kind of animal you are. And that is the beauty of it all. Because, of course, you can always say, I do it because I love it, or I do it because it's there, which is not a description of anything. We have no choice. The system has, as one of its properties, the pull to do things, to be active, to look. To. And you can see how this would be a very important select, selection principle. Animals that explore, animals that move, have the much likely possibility of survival. They're animals that sit. So that's the answer to your initial situation. So what do we mean by mind? We mean by mind, an internal state of the brain. Definable. If somebody tells me you can't define the mind, the answer is nonsense. Now you say free will. How do you define free will? But I can tell you I define free will as those activities that happen that the brain knows are about to happen. Can you say that again? Explain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because you've just been talking about what, what you said was not necessarily a generally accepted view that there are certain drives. Yes. Can I use the word innate? Of course. Innate drives, um, um, which implies an almost deterministic view of things. 
um, which makes the whole concept of free will a little bit difficult to explain. Yeah. Well, uh, two points there. The fact that it may be a, a set of fixed action patterns does not mean that it's completely deterministic in the sense that while the pattern of movement may be very similar, it's never going to be the same again ever. So all you're doing is mm -hmm. defining the boundaries of the possible movement you're going to make, or the probable drive that you're going to make. Uh, determinism and free will, well, that's something else. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I understand that free will uh, does not exist. Uh, I understand that it is the only rational way to relate to each other, that is to assume that it does. Uh, although we deeply know that it doesn't. Now, the question you may ask me is, how do you know? And the answer is, well, I did a, a actually lovely experiment on myself. Uh, it was extraordinarily revealing. <clears throat> there is an instrument that is used in neurology called a magnetic simulator. Transcranial magnetic simulation is uh, something you can do. <clears throat> well, I. This consists in what actually? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an instrument that has a coil right. that you put next to the top of the head, let's say, or somewhere in the head, and you pass a current such that a big magnetic field is generated, which activates the brain directly without necessarily to open or anything like that. So if you get one of these coils and you put it on top of your head, you can generate a movement. If you put it in the back, you see a light. So you can simulate different parts of the brain and have a feeling of to what happens when you activate the brain directly without, in quote, you doing it. Which is, of course, a strange way of talking, but that's how we talk. So I decided to put it uh, in the, in, on the top of the head, uh, where I consider to be the motor cortex, and uh, stimulate it and find a good spot where my foot on the right side would move inwards. You know, no problem. And we did it several times, and I tell my colleague, you know, I know anatomy and physiology. I can tell you I'm cheating. You put the stimulus, and then I move. But I, I feel it, I'm moving it. And he said, well, you know, how do you really know? He says, I tell you how I know. I feel it, but stimulate, and I'll move the foot outwards. I now want to do that. So I stimulate, and the, move, the foot moves inwards again. Then I said, well, what happens? So I said, but I changed my mind. <laughs> do it again. So I do it. Half a dozen times. And it always moves inwards? Always. So I said, oh my God. <laughs> in quotes. I can't tell the difference between the activity from the outside and what I consider to be a voluntary movement. If I know that it's going to happen, then I think I did it. This is, I now understand this free will stuff. Uh, this volition stuff. Volition is what happening somewhere else in the brain I know about, and therefore I decide that I did it. It happens in science as well. You actually take possession of something that doesn't belong to you. So what was your, so you are saying that because there's this straightforward linkage between the stimulation and the foot moving inward, yes. right, and that's going to happen every time, yes. but even if you will yourself to move it out, yes. and it still moves in, yes. are you saying that you nevertheless thought your sensation I, was of having moved it out? No. The sensation is that it was I who did it. Even though it was moving it in? It and moved it in, in and anyway. the sensation is, well, I moved it in. I could not, my system, I could not have a feeling different 
to what I would have had had I moved it inwards. So I want to move it outwards. When I feel the stimulus, I move it outwards, I move it in, inwards. Did you feel that you, there was a problem? No, I didn't feel there was a problem. I moved it inwards. But so, you thought you were going to, you decided you were going to move it. Yes, but I moved it inwards. And then you think and you realize that you're saying it after the fact you moved it inwards because it moved it in an inwardly manner and you knew that this was going to happen, so you take possession of it. In other words, free will is knowing what you're going to do. That's all. Not necessarily uh, willing it. Sorry. Now, for other reasons, you may find that the rest of the nervous system, other than the one that wills, basically wants to do that. You're properly educated. You think it's the most intelligent thing to do, and so on. But the feeling that it's you who's doing it is a simplification. It is not you who's doing it. It's many cells deciding to do it. Uh, does this, does this, I mean, take, you have a, um, in, at the beginning of the book, you talk about Sherrington, okay, yes. Sir Charles Sherrington, very famous neuroscientist, okay. who in, coined the word synapse, yes. whose student was Sir John Eccles, right. with whom you studied. Yes. So you have this whole tradition. Um, Sherrington gave some lectures in 1932, mm -hmm. 37, perhaps it was. I can't remember exactly. But there were some in 32 as well. Go ahead. The, the, uh, um, the Gifford lectures, yes. um, very famous, now known as Man on His Nature. Yes, right. Man on His Nature. And, and His Nature, yes. Man and His Nature, yes. And you say in your preface here that Sherrington, I, I quote, hinted that if human beings ever came face to face with their own true natures, that knowledge might trigger the demise of human civilization. Right. It's a pretty large thing to say. I mean, what did you mean by that? Is that... Well, I didn't say that. I was simply paraphrasing something right. that uh, Sherrington... Uh, was what was your interpretation? <clears throat> my, so, no, my interpretation is he believed that to be the case, that somehow uh, in order for us uh, to um, uh, respect each other, in order for us to love each other, in order uh, for us to be kind, to be civil, and so on, there had to be a mystery type component to the whole thing. That if we were to really understand why we love and what we hate and why we do what we do, that somehow the drive, somehow uh, uh, that which makes us human would disappear because somehow humanity is fed uh, by the mysterious and by the unknowable. Now, that seems to be antithetical to what you've been saying and what you've been doing all your life, you know, which, is to, right. which is to reveal That's as right. much as possible, to demystify. That's right. Uh, so, as I say in the book, I find that surprising. I said, I would, in fact, consider the opposite view, mm -hmm. which is that the more you learn about the nature of what we are, the more we would like each other and the more we would understand each other. Mostly what we do is not so much hate each other. What we mostly do is not understand each other. So indeed, if I, I think that if I could really understand another human being as well as, as physically possible, let's say, that individual would become more interesting to me rather than less interesting. At least this happens with everything else that I've done in life, and probably happens to most people, and happens for sure to scientists, that the more they understand something, the more they like it, the more they love it, the more they, they understand it. And there is an incredible um, a feeling of, of uh, not of possession, but of uh, being a part of something when you understand it. So I have to disagree deeply with Sherrington's view. We, we had, uh, we've had a couple of meetings here discussing things like science and religion. Mm -hmm. And um, th as you know, there are many scientists who have an enormous trouble making the kind of leap that you're talking about there, that they, in fact, would like to retain uh, the sense of there being some ineffable force 
outside science, outside rationality, and so on. Um, do you have any thoughts about religion? What, what happens when people come in, to, in an audience and ask you about these sorts well, of issues? Well, I, I mentioned that I, I, um, I am not religious, that I, uh, you know, in my family, my, my father was not very religious, but my mother was. And uh, discussing with my mother, um, why aren't you religious? And the answer is, well, I can't understand it. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I understand the words. But when I think about, let's say, God, and I look at you in the face and you tell me God would help me, it looks like what you want is a friend in a high place. Um, you want someone to ask favors to. Uh, it is mm, what you want that you love. You can't love an entity you don't see or understand. So what is this? And then, fortunately for me, something appeared, and uh, it was uh, a very difficult but very small book by one Baruch Spinoza, <laughs> uh, who said so very beautifully exactly what uh, one was thinking. That is that we are not made by the image and resemblance of God, but rather God is made by us, our, our image and resemblance. For instance, I was always surprised that God would require me to pray about something that I needed, knowing that he's supposed to know everything, so therefore he must know what I need and want. So why should I have to ask? Uh, not very friendly. Why do I have to pray? Why do I have to say you are great and I am small? Why? It looks like the relation between a servant and a patron. The answer is, he is very powerful and you are nothing. They better, okay, I understand that. Uh, but I don't think I agree with it. I mean, uh, you know, so the, this was the initial steps as a young person. You know, I, I, I don't understand this stuff. I mean, you, I, I, you go to mass because if you don't go to mass, you go to hell or some, some you know, they, it seems to me like a political event is happening here. And somebody has found a way to sort of organize people in a particular way. So that was basically the beginning of it. And then you, of course, understand that in fact you were right. I mean, to, to, to me, I was right in understanding that uh, if there were to be a god, it wouldn't be anything like uh, this humanoid uh, that uh, many people believe exists and is the owner and creator and so on of these things. On a larger scale, though, to go back to Sherrington's point, if you, yeah. if you exclude religion from it and yeah. so on, um, do you have a sense, uh, the, this, this need for something, do you have any sense, uh, an explanation for why people seem to have this need for the mysterious? Um, hmm. I, uh, I think it's actually a strange romantic view uh, the, the thoughts that come to mind are um, rather strange, but let me tell you, it's a little bit uh, like Groucho Marx saying, I would never belong to a club being so low that I can be a member of. So, uh, no, I, I don't think very highly of myself. Uh, I really uh, uh, don't, uh, don't want to understand, because if I understand it, it's really not very important. In fact, many great scientists said, you know, if there is no extra life or whatever, this is a mess, this is nothing, right? So it is a bit not wanting to face the fact that uh, we are okay, as we are, that we can forgive ourselves for being. 
So, in every, I mean, in everything that you do, I mean, the work that you've done from at the cellular level all the way up to using MEG mm -hmm. um, and being able to um, quite clearly show that, that people's systems are moved by electricity and so on and so forth, um, you have you are you find no evidence of anything other than, as you said at the beginning of this, um, of, of, of your talk, that, um, that the basically brains are us. I mean, that was, that was basically what you were talking about. Right. Imagine how wonderful it is. We are our brains. Now, this, this should be... Uh, uh, the source of almost all type of felicity. It's an honorable state to be in, to know that you are what you are. Would you have ever wanted to be anything, if you hadn't been a neuroscientist, uh, what would you have wanted to do instead? Well, I, I like astronomy and uh, you know, observatory and so on. So I probably would have uh, gone for something like that, uh, another type of science. I um, uh, probably not a big enough monkey to be a serious contender for physical things. So uh, I did fence, and, but I didn't think there was very much, very, a great future in being a, a, a foil champion or something like that. Uh, I didn't thought, think that professional sports were for me, really. Yet, you know. um, money is interesting, but not that interesting. Um, Are there dis any discoveries that you wish you had made, would like to have made? Beyond what you've done, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying what? Oh, uh, no. Uh, oh, do, do I wish it was I who discovered something? Um, oh, yes. I'm completely in love and fascinated by science. And uh, every time something new occurs, I have both a feeling of uh, happiness for our science, of, of admiration uh, for the person who did it, and a certain degree of um, uh, jealousy. I wish it was I who had done it, which means I really like it. What about this new work you've been doing using, can you explain this new work you've been using, using nano wires? Oh, yeah. yeah. Nano, of course, is a very much a buzz phrase. And perhaps you could explain, we're just talking about extremely small technology here and how well, it works. So it is something that is the obvious next step in the conversation we've been having. So we were saying, look, nervous system evolved to move and move intelligently, language and all the things are pre-motor events that allow you to then move intelligently. Move intelligently is what we do. That's what we do. Then extend now. Okay. We also know that these things can be modulated by electrical means. You can stimulate, you can move your foot, you stimulate, you can get somebody who has a disease to not have the disease anymore and so on. So the system is amenable to direct interaction with the external world by means other than nerves. Comma, oh my God, close parenthesis, really, and says, yeah. The problem is that the brain is guarded by bone. You know, I say in the book, you know, we, we, are, we have an exoskeleton when we mm. talk about the brain. The rest, the muscles are out and so on. So, okay. If A, the brain were to, if the cranium were to be transparent, and we could see the activity of the brain, you could, instead of looking at people's faces, you would look at people's brains and say, no, don't think that. You could see the pattern and say, no, 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 that's not, don't take it like that. The same thing happens when somebody says, tells you that they're not agreeing with you, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine that in addition to doing like that, you could say, well, what if, what if I actually communicate with you directly so we don't have to go through all this palabrat, all this talking, and I tell you exactly how I feel. 
How could I do it in principle? Well, I could go directly to the brain. The problem is, oh my God, but you have to then, you have to penetrate this, this bone. So thinking about how could we do it, this brain wave appears as well. You know, the brain is full of holes. Don't make any new ones. And what are the holes I'm, I was thinking about? It was the vascular system. So imagine blood yourself. Vessels. Hmm? The blood vessels, right. right. Imagine yourself becoming very small in one of these this beautiful whole films in science fiction. And you get into the, into the vessels and you go into the brain. Where can you go? Anywhere. The brain is, is completely vascularized. It's full of these vessels. And they occur in every 50 microns. It's a three-dimensional scaffolding that goes everywhere. So then the question is, don't go to the brain through the outside. Go to the brain from the inside. Why not put a wire up? to anywhere you want in the brain and see if you can record or simulate, or both. But it has to be a very thin wire because you don't want to bother circulation. It has to be done of such material that it's not recognized by the body as being there. Mm -hmm. Can this be done? The answer is, yeah, there's ways to protect the wire from the now you're right, this, this does sound like science fiction. And what's the, the utility would be The what? utility, <laughs> how, how, okay. The utility would be as follows. Uh, at this moment, we are getting to about uh, a 30 nanometer wire. It is uh, a third of a micron, a micron being uh, very small, thousands of a millimeter. So this is uh, like you can put several hundred in the diameter of a single hair. OK, so you can float these things in. You don't you want to do more than one. You may want to do 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or many. So you can wire the brain from the inside. What can you do? Two things. You can record or you can stimulate. OK, so you have something in front of you about your brain or in front of you, about somebody else's brain, heaven forbid, it's just a quote, the ability to address the brain. What is the first thing you do? Well, you will probably, instead of doing electrical stimulation from the top, you will do it through the vessel. Now, is this done? Is the answer is it is done every day in neurosurgery for other reasons. This People who do that are called interventional neuroradiologists, and they put in things that go around and let go of little objects that would close a vessel that has an aneurysm or something. You, you correct. So this is things that people know how to do very well. And I have many friends who are neuroradiologists. I say, okay, can you put this thing and please, I like to have my visual cortex wired. No, sure. Put it in. You put a, a little bolus of these wires, which then on touching fluid begins to slowly move out. And of course, uh, you wire part of the brain. They're so small, they're not going to impede uh, circulation. They're not going to produce coagulation. They're simply not going to be recognized as being there. Now, I assume this is primarily for repair rather than recreation, right? Why do you think that? <laughs> <laughs> because usually people get grants for fixing things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Well, yes, you can repair things. Or you can have man machine interface, seriously, for the first time, seriously, seriously. You, know. uh, you need um, to remember the name of uh, all the people that you know. So you have a little bank that, in principle, might be able to whisper to you the names of the people whose name you don't remember. Um, you may uh, buy a good program to learn how to play chess. I mean, there, there are many things that you can do, right, once you have a direct access to the brain. This is taking PDA to extremes, isn't but it? But wait, this is just <laughs> the beginning. If 
if you really love somebody, can you imagine connecting with the person seriously? Can you imagine it? Yeah, you could. Okay. Um, what about a bunch of people? Um, the rest doesn't have to be said because it is obvious. If you have an entry into the brain directly that you can read from and put into input and output, you are now not limited by your senses. Now, obviously, this has been said to you before, but this does begin to sound a little bit like an Aldous Huxley novel. Excuse me, dear. This is just what you can do. <laughs> this stuff is not a novel. It could, the fact is that you can simulate and you can record. It hasn't been done yet. I mean, this hasn't been, it has been done in frogs. It's, but we know once you have the thought, once you have the idea, once the idea is out, you know it becomes inevitable. There are too many reasons why this could be a very good idea. Not like every other idea. It has to make imagine, sure that it doesn't become it is not misused. Right? And and this is the ethics component that is so complicated and so difficult, because the answer is don't do that. Uh, because you're gonna make an impossible change. Mm -hmm. At the same time, Timon says, excuse me, I'm paralyzed. I would love to be able to move. Why are you so mean? Why is it you don't have my son who has this problem, my daughter has He's schizophrenic, has this depression, whatever. So yes, the, the medical part would come first. The next thing is, well, um, I would like to be able to have an artificial arm that I could activate directly. Suddenly the army says, hey, uh, it, it, would it be possible to have a bunch of people connected to each other such that they may operate, let's say, as a wolf pack? They all know uh, their group, that anybody is in trouble, everybody immediately knows. There's no question of making noises or anything. Suddenly, you have a collective group uh, that can protect each other much better than you can have a single individual. Is saving lives important? Uh, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So what is the limit? Well, the mm -hmm. limit of your intelligence. So, you know, it's on the table. It would be done or not done, whatever. But we know that it can be done. And we know what it means. So some people would think of it with horror. Other people would think of it as a brand new world. Now the important thing is that we have the information there so that people can make those decisions. That's right. Let me ask you a couple of questions. We have to close fairly shortly. But let me ask you a couple of other questions. Um, <clears throat> the, there's a, each year, the um, literary agent John Brockman asks people a question. Um, and a lot of people write in and give answers. Well, this year's question was, what are you optimistic about? Can I ask you the same question? You know what? I think life is really incredible. I'm optimistic about human nature. I believe that we have, especially in America, we have been historically in all kinds of trouble. I know very few countries that are as capable of jumping out of almost anything as we are. So when I look at my children, I look at my grandchildren, people say they would have a difficult life and there's no, they're packed with brains. Uh, the sad thing would be if we were ceased, we would cease to exist. I don't see that happening simply because our brain is so resourceful. Is there anybody in So the answer, being alive, is what I'm so very positive and very optimistic about. Life itself, I think, is absolutely it. 
Now, your chil- you, you mentioned ch- children. Um, you have two sons? I have two sons, yes. And they have become? They're both physicians. Right? They're fourth generation physicians now. One is a neuro-ophthalmologist, and the other one is a neurologist. So this is a long family tradition here in the beginning. Everything from the, from the neck up for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess up with these lower organs. <laughs> Uh, so you have a great deal for you to owe to your grandfather there for this. Well, um, yeah, he. It's yeah. It it, it is in fact uh, one thing that I I learned from him was how important it was to be treated as a human being when you're a child. Mm. The other thing was the. Ability. He was an, a renowned teacher. Like my father was a renowned teacher. I mean, they filled uh, rooms whenever they taught anything because they were extraordinarily clear in the exposition. Yeah. I excuse me for a bit. This is something that I always remember. I remember asking my grandfather. Now, how is it that a plane? an entity as heavy as a plane can fly. Now, this is, you know, I've asked people, and it's, it's very mysterious. This is not there. It's extraordinarily simple. The, the plane at that time, consider a plane, is just a knife, which in one plane cuts the air in up and down. And another knife in the back that cuts it from left to right, like a knife going through butter. It has to have a certain speed so the air becomes a little denser. So it has these two knives, and then it screws itself in the air with something called a propeller. I knew what a screw looked like, and I knew what cutting was, and that was it. Whatever else I've learned, including learning to fly, have my own plane, it was basically the two sentences or three sentences that I could ever sit. Mm-hmm. It's really not more complicated than that. There's a lot of details. So, yes, the ability to have simplicity at the other side of complexity. That's what one was given. That is what one definitely hopes to give when one teaches. Is there anybody that you'd have, um, thinking about great teachers, is there, is there anybody that you would have liked, historically, would have liked to have had a conversation with? I mean, you actually had a chance for some conversations with some great people. Yes, yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're all but these, but I did, so. You did, You yeah. know, I mean, I, Feynman or, or whatever. So you know, John Eccles, 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 well, of course, Eccles. and, 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 uh, and uh, mathematicians, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gelfand and, and Tom and whatever. I mean, many, many interesting people, Wheeler and, and so on. Sure. People that I would love to be able to have a, a good conversation with. Um, um, well, I, I would wonder what a conversation with Wittgenstein would be like. Uh, I don't know that it would be possible, but it, I wonder. Or um, the Turing would be like. Or with Euler would be like. So you're into mathematicians, logicians? Well, uh, this, uh, the people that somehow have managed to have the maximum simplicity after complexity. So, of course, they are the, the demigods, in the sense of, of having understood, seriously, uh, by excluding things, which is complexity after simplicity after complexity, right? Do you read much philosophy? Do you like... Oh, yes, yes. I, you know, the, the usual uh, components in uh, high school, I had good background in philosophy, as I mentioned. Um, and, uh, well, 
I read my colleagues in, in neurophilosophy or philosophy these days, and Churchill and I read, of course. But do you think that's a, a, tr a way in which we're in fact going? That's, that, that injection of more neuroscience into this is essential to a clearer understanding of but, well, some of these major it, it, issues there, like there, I, what ethics. I, yeah, what I find that is very nice about, I have problems with philosophers. My wife's a philosopher. Uh, I don't have problems with her, by the way. I have problems with philosophers, and I also immensely admire or have a lovely time with them. The nice thing about philosophers is the fact that they, they use language generally very clearly. They define the terms very nicely, a bit like mathematicians do and so on. Uh, the problem that I have with, with philosophers and with most new philosophers, there are some that are okay, but some of them are not, is that what they love to do is to analyze the problems, but they are not interested in solving any. You know, uh, the usual story that I've heard probably many times of uh, Russell's definition of a philosopher. Uh, you remember that he defined the philosopher as this person who, being standing in a corner, is approached by somebody in a bicycle who asks him, Sir, where is London? And the philosopher says, uh, Where? Where? Is. London. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> is that, you know, as long as you ask it properly, it's okay. The answer doesn't matter. I think on that note, we'll close. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Rodolfo Lima. Thank you for having me.